Warm welcome everybody and good morning both to you who are visiting us here at in Stockholm and to all of you joining us on the line. Uh, my name is Gunn Rudqvist and I come from Baltic Sea Centre which is a part of Stockholm University. And today at this Baltic breakfast we are going to talk about CCS, carbon capture and storage in the seafloor and also learn more about seabed mining in coastal areas. Two very hot topics which are on the debate agenda definitely already. Uh, the Baltic Sea Centre is uh, part of Stockholm University, as I said. We do research, of course, and we also uh, take care of this fantastic field station at Askö, outside Trosa, south of Stockholm. But Baltic Sea Centre also has a mandate and a mission to try to bridge the gap between science and policy. And this is one occasion where we can do this. We create a network of people already engaged in marine issues and try to get them together. And we can bring out researchers who can talk about their favorite subject and you will be updated what's going on and where the problems are and what can science tell you today. As always, please pose questions. You can do this either on Twitter, uh, Centrum, and the hashtag is Baltic Breakfast. Or you can also send us an email, ostersjocentrum.su.se. Or in, in the picture you will see a Slido code, probably 22102. And my colleague will try to get all your questions and we will try to address them as many as possible. But probably there will be more questions than we have time because this finishes 9.15 as always. So we will try to sort of compile answers and put them on our web so you can take part of these answers afterwards. But we will move on directly to today's topic. You know, there are many actors who uh, look towards the seabed in their work for sustainable development. I mean, rare metals are there that are really needed for green technology. Uh, companies are already planning to get them out of the seabed. And, I mean, you all know the CCS is being heavily debated through years and it's already, you know, been uh, tried out outside the Norwegian coast for years, so there are experiences and something to learn from that. But now they're also discussing this from a Baltic Sea perspective. So does this really mean that we are free to use the seabed or the seafloor to contribute to sustainable development? Are there problems? Are there things that we need to learn more about before we can do this? So help us to learn more about this, these two topics today. We have with us Gry Möll Mortensen. You are a senior geologist at the Geological Survey of Sweden. Welcome. And then you will start and there we will move on to uh, Dr. Francisco Nascimento. And you are an associate professor at the Department of Ecology, Environment and Plant Science at Stockholm University. A warm welcome to you too. So Gry, let's, I'll give the floor to you. Thank you again. Okay, hello everyone. I will give you a very short introduction to geological stories of CO2. And I'm afraid I won't miss a lot with the seabed as this is going on hundreds of meters below the seabed. And CO2 storage is actually going on as a natural process already in the Earth's upper crust. And it has been doing so for millions of years. And the injection of CO2 into the subsurface has been undertaken since the early 1970s. So this is not an, a, a new technique. This is a well-known and a mature technique. And to understand the process of, of geological storage of CO2, we need to have a little look into geology. And I suspect that you all know that the Earth consists of an inner and outer core covered by a mantle and covered by the crust. And in the crust, it's pretty much like a layered cake with different layers, with different characteris characteristics and materials. 
And if we look into CO2 storage, it can happen in different scenarios. At the picture to the left, we see CO2 storage in basaltic rock, which is actually happen happening right now in Iceland. And on the right picture, we have four scenarios. The first one is injecting CO2 into saline aquifers. The next one is injecting into uh, coal seams. And the third is uh, where we use CO2 in getting out more uh, oil and gas from a reservoir. Well, we're not doing that in Sweden, but for example, in Norway or US. And the third one, uh, the fourth one is uh, injecting CO2 into depleted oil and gas reservoirs, pretty much the same as the saline aquifers. And what is a saline aquifer? Well, a simple definition, definition of that is uh, an underground water-bearing porous and permeable layer of sedimentary rock. And in a saline aquifer, the salinity of, of the formation water is always more than 3%. So we are not speaking drinking water here. And to find uh, saline aquifers, we will have to look for sedimentary basins. And this is a map for sedimentary basins in Scandinavia. And you see that in Sweden, these are found in the southernmost part of this long land. <coughs> And speaking CO2 storage in saline aquifers, first we need to have a reservoir to be able to hold the CO2. And to do that, we need sufficient porosity and permeability. And porosity is all the small spaces that's, that is in between all the sand grains in the sandstone. And the permeability is the ability of the fluid, in this case the injected CO2, to move around and migrate in, into, um, inside the geological formation. And in order to keep the CO2 in the fluid phase, we need to have the reservoir at more than 800 meters depth. And then finally, we need to have a lid on top of the reservoir so, so the this injected CO2 can migrate to, to the surface. And this is the cap rock. So let's have a look at the reservoir rock. You can pretty much imagine like a sponge sucking up water and holding the water. It's pretty much the same uh, process in the reservoir rock. You can see here the picture uh, to the right side is from a sandstone uh, in one of the identified uh, storage units in the Southeast Baltic Sea. And the bottom picture is the same sandstone, but a close up and all the small blue area here is the porosity which can hold the CO2. And the cap rug is quite the opposite of the reservoir. It should be dense and thick and uh, not allowing the CO2 to, to migrate through it. An example of that could be shale or claystone. <coughs> And this is an overview of the parameters that I spoke about. Uh, it's, it's, these parameters are important to, to one, to ensure uh, a safe and effective storage, but it's also important to, to make sure that the CCS project is profitable. For example, we only look at uh, potential storage sites with uh, estimated uh, storage capacity of more than 100 million tons CO2 and you can compare that to, I think, <laughs> you can't hang, hang me afterwards, but I think we have more or less 40 million tons of emissions in Sweden, in Sweden per year of CO2. And a very important thing is a very, very thick uh, succession of cap rocks to keep the CO2 in the reservoir. Remember those numbers here with the 100 meters of cap rocks. So when all these parameters are fulfilled, we can end up with a picture like this, where we have the CO2 transported by ship to a platform, and beneath the platform we have CO2 pipelines and wellheads, facilitating CO2 injection deep below the seabed. So let's have a look at what's actually happening when we're ejecting CO2 under the seabed. Uh, this cartoon, the brownish color is the cap rock and the yellow color, dotted color, is the reservoir. And if you look at the top picture, well to the left, uh, we have the uh, injection well. And the injected CO2 is marked with blue. 
And what happening is that the CO2 will rise to the top and begin to migrate outwards the dipping plane of the reservoir. And at the same time, some of the CO2 will dissolve in the formation water and some of it will start to bind, to bound microstructurally. And what is happen happening is that by time the CO2 climb, the, the uh, blue dot here is getting smaller and smaller. And that's because the CO2 is bounded in more effectively. So by time the migrating or the free CO2 will, uh, will uh, not be there. And so why could we store, why do we think we can store CO2 in Sweden? If you remember the map with the sedimentary basins, you saw the sediment sedimentary basins in Sweden were in the southern part. And this is exactly where we have identified potential storage units. And in the southeast Baltic Sea, we have identified uh, three potential storage units. And in the southwest Scania part, uh, five uh, potential storage units. But as you know from the layered cake, the geology is, the layers are stacked upon each other. So let's go into the deep. This, uh, these are the same areas with Southeast Baltic Sea at the right and Southwest Scania to the left. And I have bringed in all the storage, uh, potential storage units. And you might think that, oh, there's only four on the left side. And that's because the second one, I'll point, oi. Okay, the second one under the green sand uh, is actually two, two storage units in two slightly different ge geographical positions. And this is a very messy, you don't need to look into all of these numbers, but I just included it, so maybe you can have a look at it after the talk. This is, these are all the different parameters for each of the eight uh, storage units, and some examples of uh, estimated storage capacities. But... If you want to be more accurate about estimating storage capacities, the best thing is to make modelings and uh, reservoir simulations. And this one is an example <coughs> using the program uh, <coughs> Eclipse 100. And this uh, program is uh, modelling the injection wells and the migration path of, the, of this injected CO2. And of course, we need to monitor uh, the injected CO2. These are pictures from Norway, as uh, Gunn uh, mentioned. The Norwegian CO2 project, or CCS project, Sleipne, uh, which is on the, the southern part of the Norwegian Sea, or the North Sea. And as you can see on these pictures, you see the plimes, the CO2 plimes in the lower picture here, and the seismic showing that no CO2 is escaping. And this uh, CO2 injection has been going on f uh, since 1996. And of course, we have some challenges as, as well if we're going to store CO2 in, in Sweden. And these are examples of that. I don't have time to go into every one, but one important thing is to have very thorough investigations of the, of the rocks that we are meant to, to use for, for, uh, for, for storage. And we also need to have test injection to analyze the behavior of the CO2. And then we have a couple of um, regulations and legislations that could be a problem. Uh, one of those is the Helsinki Convention uh, prohibiting um, dumping of garbage on the seafloor. And in this manner, CO2 and garbage are, are the same. And finally, I will just share this link with you. Uh, this is an open platform with a CO2 storage atlas where you can go in and see potential storage sites in, in Sweden, Denmark, Norway, and Iceland. And that was all for me. Thank you for listening. Thanks a lot. This was extremely interesting. So, I mean, I don't know anything about geology really, but it sounds as if there are no really major problems from the geological perspective. Is that so, or do I misunderstand this? Well, if you do the, the pre-work very thoroughly and, and look into that, you are sure you have the distributions, the right porosity and the, the um, 
cap rocks are, have this, the conditions that you want, then it's no problem. We have, as I mentioned in the beginning, we have uh, injected CO2 into the subsurface since the 1970s with no, no um, problems with that. So what about impact on sort of the rest of the marine ecosystem? And now we've been talking about <laughs> geological perspectives, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, there has been a project uh, named STEM, STEM CCS, I think it was uh, Norway who run that project, where they did some, uh, sim no, not simulation, they did some injection of CO2 into the surface and let it uh, seep out to study what happened to the ecosystem. And as far as I know, nothing happened. Nature oh. adapts. And we actually, ha we actually have natural seeps, for example, in Italy, uh, out at the sea bottom outside of Sicily. And uh, nature adapts. OK. So far, so good, in other words. Thanks mm. a lot. We'll get back to more questions later. Mm. And uh, now let's move on to talk about the seabed, the sea f sort of the, f the actual seabed. And let's talk about uh, seabed mining. Well, you've all heard about deep sea mining. It's been sort of on the agenda for a long time. I think 13 countries actually prohibited s deep sea mining. And then they look into the coastal areas for seabed mining. So Francisco, the floor is yours, please. Yes, thank you, Gun. Um, yeah, so I'm Francisco Nascimento. As Gun said, I'm, I'm associated with the uh, Department of Ecology, Environment and Plant Sciences at Stockholm University, but I'm also a Baltic Sea Fellow, and I have double uh, affiliation with the Baltic Sea Center. Um, so today I'll be talking to you about the seabed mining uh, prospects in the Baltic Sea and what is the potential for ecological impacts uh, for biodiversity, benthic biodiversity and ecosystem functioning associated with this activity. Yes, so these are, this is basically the the big question that we're trying to, to, to address is what are the environmental risks associated with seabed sea mining of rare earth minerals in the Baltic Sea? Short answer is that we don't know yet and we want to find out and we have uh, a strong plan to do it. Um, yes. So why are we even thinking about this? I mean, uh, we can almost for sure expect impacts but why is this even being considered? And as uh, Gun mentioned, and most of you know, the uh, modern economy is, is um, dependent on the supply of these rare earth minerals. So there have many different applications, and a, a lot of them, this, this slide shows just some examples of where, of where they can be applied, where they're used in different economical sectors. Um, but a lot of these, a lot of these rare earth minerals are essential for electrification uh, and a transition to a low carbon economy. And uh, so, how come we're thinking about the Baltic Sea for this, mining the Baltic Sea for this? Well, it turns out that some areas of the Baltic are very rich in what we call nod uh, iron manganese nodules. So these. Um, these are basically, uh, as you can see from the picture, so the picture of the bottom uh, with some of these nodules, these are basically rock-like formations that are rich in iron, manganese, phosphorus, and other rare minerals like copper and cobalt. So these are more or less the size of a potato, these nodules. And uh, these areas can be rather large. Uh, this is a figure from a study from Laura Kaukonen and, and her colleagues. Um, that sh where she, based on the, the um, physical conditions of the seabed in the Baltic Sea, they have modeled where we can expect these nodules to happen and, and uh, at what concentrations, basically. So the left, or the your left side uh, picture uh, shows where uh, large concentrations of these nodules can be expected in the Finnish coastline, and uh, on the other side, you can see where lower concentrations of these nodules can be expected. Uh, as far as I know, there is not public available data for the Swedish coastlines, but we can expect it to be a very similar picture for the Swedish coastline. Sorry, wrong way. Yes. So, 
Why are we interested about this now? Well, this is actually a pressing topic because there is already commercial interest in exploring these nodules uh, in, uh, outside the Hvaliftio uh, coastline. There's a, a company, Scandinavian Ocean Minerals, that has applied for permits to explore these nodules um, outside these areas. So how do they plan to do this? Um, uh, I can just give you a very layman explanation, but they plan to use what they call the airlift technique, so which is basically uh, vacuum cleaning the seafloor. But they will, uh, or the plan is to uh, vacuum clean the first five to ten centimeters of the sediment, uh, bring it up to a platform uh, at the surface of the sea, and uh, Civet, so they're interested in nodules that are bigger than one millimeter. Uh, they keep those and all the particles larger than one millimeter, and then they will release everything else back into the seafloor. So they will create also these uh, plumes or, or clouds of sediment that will settle down. Yes. So what do we know so far? Actually, uh, Seabed mining has been, uh, um, has been investigated mostly in the deep sea because this is where we have large deposits of these nodules. Um, so, a lot of, so in '89 there was a, a large project where uh, the disturbance of a deep sea ecosystem was simulated uh, and then they followed the recovery of this, of this ecosystem. So a lot of our knowledge is based on the ecology of deep sea and how it how it uh, responds and recovers from, from disturbance. So this was done, this was an experiment that, uh, that disturbed the seafloor at 4,000 meters depth, and then they followed um, the recovery. So here it's, um, I will show you three different graphs with three different types of fauna of animals. So th this is what we call the first one about the, re the response of megafauna, which are animals larger than one centimeter, invertebrates mostly. Um, and then here on the x-axis you can see uh, the recovery time in years, so they follow the recovery in during several years. And on the y-axis you have what we call the standard mean difference from the baseline. And the baseline there is, is showed as a dotted line. So, so the different colors are different surveys that will be done a little bit differently. But you, you can follow the red line, which is the most standardized methods. Uh, and then you can see there's a, a strong immediate impact on the abundance of this megafauna, and then after seven years it hasn't still uh, returned to the baseline. Then we go to a little bit smaller animals, what we call macrofauna, animals uh, bigger than half a millimeter. And here you, you see a similar picture, uh, impacts right after, uh, but the recovery has cl is closer to the baseline after seven years. And if you go even to smaller animals, what we call meofauna, so animals smaller than one millimeter, there we see that, uh, um, that uh, uh, after the ha actually we have more data, we have the study has gone to 25 years, and there is uh, a value closer to the baseline in terms of abundances. So the main takeaway message here is that we, is that we have impacts, strong impacts at the beginning at all sizes of fauna, but there's different recovery potentials depending on the size of the animals. Um, yes, so another survey, also in the deep sea in the same site, uh, followed the recovery of even smaller things, bacteria. Uh, and here we can see it, uh, they have different sites, the reference in, in green, and then uh, uh, different impacted sites with different uh, intensities going to the, to the left, and then they even did a, a very recent um, disturbance uh, that's five weeks before sampling. And, there, and on the y-axis here, what you can see is the abundance of bacteria. And then here we see again, when the intensity of, m of the disturbance is high, of the mining activity, we, uh, bacterial counts, cell numbers are significantly lower than the, other, than the reference area. And this is even after 26 years afterwards. They also looked at not only the number of bacteria, but also the activity of bacteria and their capacity to degrade um, big carbon compounds. 
Uh, and there we see also uh, an impact that after 26,000 years, this function of, of performed by bacteria is not back. So at high intensities, the bacterial abundance and activity does not recover even after 26 years. Yes. So this is what we know. But actually, what we don't know is how coastal ecosystems react to the same type of pressures. So there's virtually no data related to, to seabed mining for ecosyst coastal ecosystems like the Baltic. And these are the questions we want to, uh, to answer with our new project that will start uh, soon, uh, this spring. So we expect significant impacts on benthic biodiversity. I think we, we, if, we, if you vacuum clean the first five to ten centimeters, it's a reasonable expectation that biodiversity will be impacted. But also we are interested in how fast the system recover. Uh, and if, if the trajectories of recovery are different for the different types of, of communities that, com that compose biodiversity. Also, we'll be looking at uh, ecosystem function, like the carbon and nitrogen cycle, because we will, uh, we will remobilize a lot of carbon that has been sequestered in these deeper layers of the sediments. There is a uh, potential that greenhouse gas fluxes from these sediments will increase. Um, but we don't know if this is how long this effect might happen and, and how, how fast the recovery is. Yes, so how we will find out? Yes, so we have, uh, as I mentioned, we have a new project that was funded, selected for funding in the end of November last year that we're just starting. And it's basically uh, divided in three parts. So the first part, we want to study the impacts in, di in biodiversity, benthic biodiversity. And here we will look at all components of diversity. We'll look at small things like bacteria, archaea and, and uh, protists but also look at the animals present there, like myofauna and this macrofauna. Uh, and we will, as I said, we will look at the temporal dynamics of recover between and the differences between these communities. The second part of the study will also try to quantify the impacts on ecosystem function. So how is the carbon cycle, how is the nitrogen cycle impacted in this, in these, uh, after this disturbance and how long it takes to recover. Then we will use all this information uh, to, cr to, to um, let's say, improve uh, ecological risk assessment tools that can help managers to evaluate the risks for a larger area than the just the ones we're investigating. So, thank you very much for listening. Thank you. Um, <laughs> thanks a lot, Francisco. Um, you're actually saying that even though we can't be sure because the coastal areas, they haven't been studied so far, there will be effects based on what you can sort of predict from other studies. Yes, I think, it's, as I said, I think that's a reasonable explanation. Okay, so the, or recovery, expectation. Ta the recovery time, yeah. etc., is the vague thing here. Well, yeah, exactly. I think, so, as I said, as, as if you're vacuum cleaning the first 10 centimeters of the sediment, you're removing the biological active part of the, of the sediment. And why would this disturbance be problematic? I mean, f well, I for all of you who work with this, it's obvious, but yeah. for the rest of us? Well, basically that's where all creatures live. It's where you have, sedim where you have oxygen or all uh, animals and, 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 uh, and, and protists. So this is where you have uh, a lot, this is where you have most of the food, this is where most of the oxygen to survive. Uh, so this is where most of the biodiversity okay. is. So it's a functioning system so yes. that we're talking about. Yes, okay. uh, where this is where the biological process is happening faster, and, there's, and they have a, they translate to a higher uh, rates of ecosystem processes. Okay. Thank you so far. Gry, please join us here, mm. and we will turn this off. Please come a bit closer here. We can be in the same picture. Here. Yes. Yes, all right, so we will very soon pick up questions also from all of you, but let me start at least here. Um, as you were saying, uh, Guri, regarding carbon capture and storage, this is on its way to happen, it's being planned. Uh, do you think you know enough to get started, or should one do more studies before? In Sweden? Yes, now we're talking Sweden. Well, in Sweden, we the, the maps that I show you has, has been based on very old and very analog data. So we definitely need more complementary data. We need more seismics, more wells to analyze how, how the rocks 
uh, looks and how the porosity looks like and permeability and the denseness of, of the cap rocks and so. And at, at uh, ge the Geological Survey of Sweden, you've got an mission to do this, right? Uh, well, we just got a uh, large governmental uh, assignment to, <coughs> to investigate uh, the rocks um, that we have started in earlier. Okay. So this is, this is going to take several years beco before this can uh, okay. be, a be in, in reality in yeah. practice. Yeah. All right. So a similar question then, Francisco, <coughs> from your perspective, do you think that we have time now to look at the biodiversity impact before it's going to happen? You know, the seabed mining will be there in practice. Are we putting the right sort of studies in place? Well, I hope so. I hope we have the time to carry out this project before uh, large-scale exploration happens. Mm -hmm. um, the project is around three years and it will take a little bit longer to get all the results out. Of course, yes. Um, and, I, I, and I think there's a large interest from authorities that regulate this type of activities that we have more information and build mo better ecological risk yeah. assessment mm -hmm. models. Because of course the companies need to do an environmental impact assessment yeah. when they apply for yeah. a permit. Would you say that that impact assessment is demanding enough? Or? Well, uh, what we plan to do goes a lot deeper than uh, a, a normal environmental impact assessment. And I think um, and that's in this case, is, I think it's justifiable because it's the first time uh, in the Baltic that uh, this type of activity is being considered. Then I think uh, it's prob after we, we know more, it's, it's, this is a large interdisciplinary project. It takes marine ecologists, bioinformaticians, se sequencing technology, biogeochemists. So it's a bit uh, too much to ask for a company to yeah, put all these competences mm -hmm. together. But I think this is why uh, I think uh, funding from a research council is important to, to bring deeper information of uh, course, before, before you, get you, you get started. There. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks so far. Uh, now let's uh, invite you all to have questions and we also have probably questions from people on the web. Who wants to get started? Yeah, please. Please pres introduce yourselves. Good morning. My name is Craig Eason. I'm an independent uh, journalist from Fathom World. Um, it's a question actually on the the uh, mining question there. You mentioned towards the end of the presentation nitrogen. I was just interested how you think mining activities will impact um, algal blooms um, in the Baltic because the algal and the, uh, um, the issue there in the Baltic is mm. seen as quite critical in the environment of the Baltic. Mm. And I was just wondering how you currently think that that yeah. deep sea mining or the disturbance of the of that layer of seabed will impact negatively or positively mm. eutrophication so this area that is being uh, planned for exploration is uh, in the northern part of sweden which has uh, little has no real problems with cyanobacterial blooms um so the, the salinity is a little bit too low for, for, these, um, for this normal um, cyanobacteria that happen a little bit further south around the Gotland Basin. Um, but I think a lot of very important steps of, of the nitrogen cycle, like denitrification, uh, happen in the sediment. Uh, denitrification is when uh, dissolved uh, nitrogen gets transformed back into the gas form and it gets released again. Um, so, especially in eutrophied um, ecosystems like the Baltic Sea, that's an important function. And we know a lot of this uh, is connected to what happens in the, in the surface uh, of the sediment. So, this was likely going to be disturbed if you vacuum clean the first 10 centimeters of the sediment. But again, there is a potential. And one thing I didn't mention in, in the presentation is that. Um, the knowledge that we have today is that our base in deep sea ecosystems are very stable ecosystems. So temperature, salinity, uh, the input of food is, ver is f quite constant. Um, so these communities that are adapted to these ecosystems are adapted to a very stable environment. It's not the same in coastal ecosystems where things are more dynamic and, and communities are more adapted to, to a higher level of disturbance. So there is a potential that these ecosystems recover faster also in terms of 
functions that are related to the nitrogen cycle. So maybe I could add a question to that one. Thanks, thanks, Craig, for bringing this up. What about CCS? You talked about sort of uh, effects. We already discussed this. You know, mentioned Italy, etc. But what about positive side effects? Could there be positive side effects? I don't know, but on the well, other rest of the ecosystem, from, except from storing so the exactly, seeds. except from <laughs> storing the seed. Um, <coughs> Um, well, we can think about I this. I think well, that's we, uh, positive enough. <laughs> uh, that's positive enough. Okay, here we have a question from the web, right? <coughs> yes. Yeah, we have a lot of questions from the web actually today. Uh, but uh, first, on CCS, um, the question is: we talk a lot about the possibilities, but what are the risks, environmental risks, mm. and impacts of this? Well, I think the, the risk that you speak most about is the risk of leakage. Uh, but that, and that's exactly why we need to do this, all this thorough uh, investigation to see if we have any faults that could be reactivated by pressure buildup, for example. So you mean actually carbon dioxide sneaking out back? Yeah, but uh, a way to, to come to that for the pressure build out it is to have uh, so-called water producing wells beneath uh, 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 on the side of the injection wells. So when you're injecting CO2, at the same time, you're taking up water to, to be able to manage the, the pressure buildup in, in the reservoir. And by that, not reactivating old faults and so. So I, I mean, if you do all the, the work uh, thorough enough, there shouldn't be any risks. But how about on the ecosystems and life in the sea? <coughs> where yeah, that, that sounds as if that needs to be studied a bit more. Uh, <laughs> shall we take one from the floor ag again? Yes. Um, I'm Michelle Verstraten from Stockholm University, and I have a question about the seabed mining, because you mentioned um, particles above one millimeter are sieved. So I'm wondering what happens to the animals that live in the, in the sediment that are bigger than that? What happens to them, and how are they separated from the nodules? Yeah, so... Um, most of the animals that live in, this, in these sediments are um, macrofauna and myofauna, but th there's only one, mostly one species of macrofauna that is dominant, is Monoporea finis. Um, and then that species becomes even more important for that ecosystem because of the bioturbation function that is the only one that performs it. Um, then we have a lot of smaller, smaller um, species also. Um, so, the likelihood is that a lot of these, these animals larger than one millimeter will, will die during the process. But I know I have, have contacts with, with the Scandinavian Ocean Mineral Company and they are planning to uh, try and minimize these impacts on Monoporeo with by uh, trying to, uh, with jets, uh, move them away from, from the from the uh, vacuum cleaner before they do it. So yes. they're, they're aware of this, of these impacts. Okay. Thank you. Yes, please. Yeah, back to CCS then. Uh, what is the energy cost of pumping CO2 into the ground? I presume pressure builds up the more you pump down, so at some point it's not energy efficient to do so. Mm, interesting. Energy perspectives of mm -hmm. CCS. <coughs> well, well, I think that all all methods demand energy. When you're making hydrogen, it's demanding energy. When you're storing CO2, it's demanding energy. When you're capturing CO2, it's demanding, demanding energy. And I think that's just one of the costs of it. But we are researching all the time uh, being better and doing this more cost effective and energy effective. So I think we just need, need to to calculate it in, into to the total cost of it. So it is being studied, in other words? Yes. Yes. All right, please. So this is Orian Modin from Stockholm University. Um, so maybe you mentioned that, but I was wondering if there are any assessment of the capacity of storing carbon on a global level in relation to global emissions of carbon dioxide. Yeah, well, it seems like that uh, first investigations say that there are millions of gigatons storage cap capacity around the world, but uh, the, the um, storage units, the storage sites need uh, more investigations to be able to, 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 uh, to start up 
as a as a storage uh, project. But it seems like there, there have been plenty, there, there are plenty of uh, storage capacity around the world. So, so uh, I'm sorry, maybe I'm just getting back to the same issue here again, but um, do you feel that when you look at these storage capacity, are the ecosystem perspectives included, or are people more sort of focusing on energy efficiency, carbon storage capacity, etc.? Or are we sort of being a bit you know, narrow-minded in this issue? Well, I think that uh, as, as the storage sites or the storage units are so far deep uh, in the seafloor, um, the ecosystem are not affected. It's only the small um, drilling uh, well, area, yeah, uh, drilling like area, well heads, and, and pipelines. So I, I don't think it's a big issue. Okay, really. would you agree, Francisco? Or <laughs> 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 yeah, I think so. I mean, it seems I'm convinced by the arguments. Mm -hmm. Of course, perhaps uh, I've seen in the picture. I mean, the most of the impacts will be of these large structures that you that you mm -hmm. place on the seabed to to inject the CO2. A more local mm. perspective. But uh, I mean, it's always about uh, what you, uh, balancing the risks of and course. the gains, right? I yes. think here. Okay. And I think if you look at, for example, wind farms today, they are making a kind of um, artificial reefs, also having uh, mollusk and so for, the, for, for, for tumblers, I, don't, mm. I can't use the word in English, but so I think yeah, well, I come back to the one yeah. I thing I said before, that nature adapts to the new environment. So, okay. Thank you so far. Yes? Lisa? Yes, uh, Francisco, have there been any projects trying to rebuild the soil ecosystem after deep sea mining has disturbed it? And if so, what did the results show? To rebuild? Um, not that I'm aware of, and I'm not sure how that would actually be done. Um, so what this large project that, that is funded by the European Union uh, off the coast of Peru that I mentioned, uh, uh, but they disturbed, they did simulated disturbance and let it be after for 26 years. So basically there was uh, no disturbance afterwards. Um, but I mean, I'm not even sure how you would <laughs> restore that habitat. You just need to, it's a bare, these are bare sediments. There, then the position keeps happening in this, and the, the habitats is slowly restored, but it's the rock recolonization as as um, is slow. And I think the physical environment doesn't get back to to normal. I didn't show those pictures, but these studies show pictures that uh, even after 26 years in in the deep sea, you can still you can still see this, the tracks of the disturbance. So it will be another ecosystem is a strange one. Yeah, it uh, will be it, it, the at least. But the, again, these are more stable yeah. ecosystems than, talking about deep sea than, than the ones we are talking about the Baltic. Right. So, okay, more questions, comments? Yes, please here. Uh, thank you, Sarah Naturfridsforeningen. So I have two questions. One for you, one for you. <laughs> and the first one is, and maybe you mentioned this, and I'm sorry if I missed it, but what's the potential of capturing uh, carbon dioxide in the in the seabed compared to carbon dioxide being captured and stored in uh, trees and mangroves and seagrasses and salt mor salt marshes and all that? Mm. And the question for you is about trade-offs. Uh, <laughs> and I know that when you're a researcher, you m might not, you know, you're not supposed maybe to have your too many of your own um, ideas. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, but I wanted to know in terms of trade-off, uh, would it be fine losing some uh, meiofauna, some megafauna, if it means that we can electrify the uh, you know, transport sector, etc.? Mm. Or what's your take on that? Well, that's a big political Thank issue. You. That's yeah. interesting. <laughs> yes. uh, Francisco, you go first. So I go first. Okay. Yeah, so, yes. <laughs> yeah uh, I think that's a, a good question. And that's larger than just marine ecology, right? And of course, I mean, the likelihood is that these min minerals will have to come from somewhere. Uh, and it's also a security issue. Uh, a lot of, uh, I think, China controls f more than 40% of the reserves of these minerals. Um, so it's important, it's a national security issue to have access to these, to these minerals. Um, and the trade-offs not only include that, but also includes if the minerals come from land, so what are the associated eco ecological impacts of that? Um, so this is a part of, of uh, 
perhaps a follow-up that I'm interested in is actually once we have data comparing the risk associated with seabed mining with, for example, a normal uh, mine, terrestrial mine. And maybe I didn't make that clear in my presentation, but this, this is a one-time impact. So once these, these nodules take uh, yeah, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of years to build, build up, so they'll go there once, they take what they can, and then that's it. Okay. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, well, you ask for storage capacity, and I would say that geological storage capacity is by far much larger than what could be taken up in, for example, trees. I can give an e example from the project Nordics, which is shown on the last slide. And uh, we did some estimations that only the saline aquifers, the best saline aquifers we looked at in that project, <laughs> could be able to store uh, CO2 emissions from all of Scandinavia for more than 500 years. Well, that's a fantastic potential. Yeah. <laughs> well, time is always running out. I'd like to ask you one final question. Now you so, so are in a position, I'm, I'm saying here, that you can wish something from policymakers. What would you like to see happen tomorrow <laughs> to sort of make it easier mm. for your work to continue to go on for this to happen in a good manner? Mm -hmm. Well, I would like the politicians in the Baltic area to look at the Helsinki Convention to to get to agreement that CO2 could could uh, would not be be seen as a, a garbage and not dumped on the sea floor, but is stored underneath the sea floor. Okay, so all the the member countries can now go home and work with this. Yeah. Great, thank you, <laughs> Francisco. <laughs> Yeah, what would I like to see from, from a policy perspective? Um, yeah, not sure, but I think it's important to be supported by that policy making is very well grounded on scientific data. Uh, so, um, so maybe not time for your studies? Yes, not, no, not take rash decisions, wait for the data to come in uh, on both sides. Let's not be too conservative either because of the trade-offs that Sarah mentioned, mm -hmm. but let's not be too rash uh, uh, either. So, okay. so, to ha um, so wait for the information to come in and take decisions. Yeah. Okay, thank you ever so much. And thank you all for being here and listening and being on the web listening to us. We will be back in March and now my colleague Ellen can tell you about the topic in March a bit uh, shortly. Uh, in March we will talk about um, the compensatory releases of salmon and eel uh, that's part of the permits for hydropower. So how are they, uh, is it time to reevaluate them or are they still uh, functioning? Another hot topic as you see. So thanks a lot for today and have a nice day.